Thank you very much for coming. My name's Kinvara Balfour, and we're going to be interviewing someone tonight who I really respect. She is a futures visionary, an eco-fashion icon, a wife, a mother, um, and a real inspiration. So before I welcome her on stage, we're going to take a little look at what she's been up to in a short film. But anyway, Lucy Siegel um, challenged me and said, do you think, because you have an eco-business, do you think you can do all the red carpets wearing only eco-fashion? Mm. And I thought, well, we can try. I'm not going to end up, I'm not going to walk a red carpet wearing a sack of potato, but we can try. <laughs> and so it was, it was almost a game at the beginning. Was, you know, beautiful excuse to be on the red carpets. It gave me a purpose there. Um, and I also used it because I, I was dealing with that in my professional life as a way of campaigning for some of the issues that I felt passionate. And after a couple of years that I was doing it on my own, um, I thought, well, I now have to involve the big fashion designers because they are the ones who have to change and you know, the women that read magazines want to know what the big designers are up to. So I have to start from them. And I knock at lots of doors and they all said yes, fortunately. And, um, and then it became, from a red carpet exercise, it became a proper consultancy business because we started going into supply chain issues right. and a lot of companies that we started working with for red carpets, they actually came to us and said, well, what if we want to do it past just the red carpet exercise? And so this year we launched the Green Carpet Challenge brand mark. Um, we are and, and, and in terms of you going to designers and asking them to change or the green fashion that you were wearing on the red carpet, just explain to us what's different about that from the normal dress. What, what is the difference? There's, there's issues of sustainability, fair trade, um, we never separate environmental impact from social justice. Okay. So we have a Green Carpet Challenge fabric library that we give, we open the doors to designers when we do a project with them. Uh, you know, they might have been using the, a certain kind of silk for many years and we, right. we, we propose a different kind of silk, which is equally beautiful and the same mm -hmm. color, but somehow has been made with less... Yeah environmental... Okay, so it's better on the environment, but it's also, also better with, with the actual people who make it. They're yes. treated better, yes. better standards of working. Yes, yes. so we okay. start also assessing their production chain, their supply chain, and helping them join in the dots, because sometimes some of these things are already in place in their companies, mm. and they don't know, because they're too busy creating the dress. They don't ask the right. questions. Right. Um, so it's, been, it's very interesting. And obviously, uh, every designer is different, every relationship is different um, and we have always been very proactive uh, with brands and trying to propose pro certain projects we, we took the leather project to Gucci yes we knew we had to you know this fantastic opportunity to launch the first ever zero deforestation certified leather from the Amazon mm. and we took the project to Gucci because we identified Gucci as the perfect brand for this project and they were um, receptive or and they, they loved it because yes. you know they were already doing a, a lot of um sustainable practices in place in that company they're part of the caring group which already has um a big sustainable sustainability department so we knew that they were more you know open than other brands and also okay. the, the leather as it happened from brazil was uh, arriving in italy branded as made in Italy leather and and yeah. so you know there was also that issue too we wanted an Italian brand to expose that that not and all Italian leather exactly and this is a bag when you call it zero zero deforest deforestation zero certified. deforestation certified so that basically means that there is not a single tree cut down yes no because one of the things that we encounter you know we're very lucky we encounter a lot of different issues and one of the issues that we came across a couple of years ago was a Greenpeace report that was then picked up by the National Wildlife Federation and the Rainforest Alliance about how two-thirds of deforestation is caused by cattle ranching and therefore right. leather yes. is 80% of deforestation happens because of leather. Wow. So once you hear that you think okay we can campaign about it all our life right. but 
we're going to change very little, or we can create a product, change the supply chain, implement, embed it in a company so that the ranches in Brazil start to ranch differently if the brand wants to buy the right leather, and then from two ranches grows to four, and then to ten, and then it multiplies until the day, hopefully, that, you know, everything is done properly without chopping trees. Exactly, without chopping trees. So when, when we looked on the film, something like with the Meryl Streep wearing the gown that you got L'Envin to design, how did that happen? How did that come about? You just literally knock on Albert, <laughs> Alba's door and be like, did, I mean, well, was Meryl receptive or you've really yes. had to really persuade no, these people Meryl or are people a, very open to no, you? No, Meryl was, is, has always been a huge supporter of the Green Cup Challenge. Mm -hmm. And um, when... Uh, you know, the, during the awards season, we were, we, I spoke to Meryl and then I, I spoke to Albert separately and I knew that there would have been probably a match made in heaven. There's very and few so people <laughs> who can be calling up these people, A, and B, actually make it, getting them to do something like that. I really, I take my hat <laughs> off to you. I know why they do it, because you're so lovely and nice, but I, it's also a very important issue. But there's a lot of people who have that intention, but people don't actually follow it through. And that's obviously where you stand apart is that you really follow through with these intentions yes. with really amazing people, with globally famous people who are <laughs> often very controlled and have all sorts of people around them telling them what to do. Well, sometimes it's easier than other times, yeah. you know. Yeah. So the yeah. gold dress that, that Meryl wore, what, what was, what, why was that ethically? Well, that was a wonderful example of what I was saying before, that a lot of the time designers just need to join the dots okay. and we help them join the dots. Sometimes they might be working with the mill for a long, long time and they never ask the question, Is, do you have any certification in place? Okay. And, and mills sometimes do and uh, some fabrics, some textiles of that mill in particular is certified. And the designer never knew, because never why, knew. why should they ask? Yeah. Um, so now it's up to the designer to ask, but also what you're saying is it's up to the consumer to ask. And that's really your mission, isn't it? To educate yeah. not only the designer, but the consumer. So the consumer has the choice to go and say, I choose not to buy that product from that company because they don't support what I want them to support. Yeah, because, you know, when you... I like... I don't know, most, I, I'm sure most people are the same. First of all, I like to be an active citizen. Right. And I really believe in acting citizenship. Whatever you do, a designer is a citizen, you know, a celebrity is a citizen, you know, yeah. a, a male owner, whoever you are, you are a citizen first and foremost. Yeah. So you need to be active. And, and also, if you take responsibility, you are in control. And I don't like not to be in control. You know, so it's just, I think it's very... Fair enough. Yeah. yeah. Long way that go. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and so after something like with the Meryl Streep, so then you, you created some awareness. So a lot of designers actually started looking and saying, okay, we can do this too. So this takes us now to a recent event that you've done, which is in association with net porte the online retailer. And I am wearing tonight a jumpsuit by Roland Murray for the Green Carpet Yay. Challenge, yes. which is lovely. Thank you, Roland Murray. <laughs> So yes. with this, you went to five of the biggest designers in the world, all of them British, good, good old British fashion, Roland Murray, Erdem, Christopher Kane, Victoria Beckham, and Christopher Bailey at Burberry. And you went to them and said, please design sustainably. How, would you cl how do you class this? They, well, they we call them the Green Carpet Challenge brand standards. Marked, brand standards. Marks. Yes. Okay, and what so does that mean? So they follow our criteria, which okay. is quite a thorough criteria, very specific, but at the same time, it's also open to different designers. As I said, different designers have different issues. They work differently. Yeah. And in our company, we always have this not very elegant um, way of saying, which is how do you eat an elephant? You can't eat an elephant in one piece. You have to cut it to pieces. So we yeah. get each design house and each designer and we see where they source the fabric, how they do it, and we try and, and implement. So we, we try to help them join the dots to implement the way that they work, to introduce new fabrics and uh, look at their supply chain and how they produce. And so it's a way for the designers, as I said, to stop for a moment and thinking, oh, you know. Yeah. I think for me as well is that I perhaps before thought of eco-fashion or sustainable fashion and, and, and thought a lot of, as you said, the sack of potatoes or the hemp shirt. And in fact, you've turned this on, on its head. This is all extremely glamorous, extremely wearable. It's well, no different from normal 
fashion. No, because what I think about, take it 20 years step back, um, even 30 years, in the, you know, or go to the 40s, the 50s, the 60s, fashion was very glamorous. But we didn't have the problems that we have today. Yes. You know, we had two seasons, right. spring, summer, also winter. We had couture. Women were shopping differently. Designers were creating differently. And then suddenly, in the last 20 years, fast fashion got hold of our life, yes. <laughs> basically. We got brainwashed to mm -hmm. think that we have to buy, 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 buy. The season became too many. Mm -hmm. um, in the case of fast fashion, sometimes you have 60 collections a year. I mean, it's completely unsustainable. Who needs so much stuff anyway? Yes. You know, and, and we, we think to believe that it's democratic to buy a T-shirt for $5. But I always say it's the democracy of who? Yes. You know, not the people who produce it. And we saw it. You so know, as with the consumer? Rana Plaza collapse, we saw what happened. Exactly, exactly, which must be a real cause close to your heart now that you've yeah. spent so much time with these people. I think your message really is, is then is to know what you're buying, where it's come from, and to consume less in general. Yeah, to buy, you know, we lose, Lucy Siegel, the other day we were having a conversation, she said, if you could commit to, to wear something 30 times, at the moment of purchase, you ask yourself, will I wear it 30 times? It's already a big step ahead. Yes. And tonight, you're, are you wearing something that you've worn 30 times? <laughs> well, tonight I'm wearing my grandmother's dress. It's your grandmother's dress. <laughs> my Fantastic. grandmother actually so handmade it. it. Oh. And then uh, I recut it a little bit because it was too big for me many, many years ago. But it's a Fantastic. dress that I love. Um, I had an attempt of, you know, trying to be a little bit um, fashionable because I never am. <laughs> Always I'm never trendy. Are. I'm not a trendy person. But I thought, you know, it's a little bit punky. Can I be punky with my grandmother dress? I don't know. I tried. <laughs> Granny would be very proud. <laughs> so I'm going to talk a little bit now about something you've done with Chopin, the jeweler. And um, you have basically gone to, you went to them with the same idea and have created this, in, this whole collection, which you launched in the Cannes Film Festival last year. This year. This year, 2013. Yes. We're going to take a little look at the film and then we're going to talk about that. Yes. So explain to us, so fair mind gold, what's the difference of fair mind gold and shouldn't all be gold be fair mind at this well, stage? It should, that's a very good point. Um, when I met Caroline Sheffield, the creative director and owner of Chopard, we were having, it was last year at the Oscars 2012, and we were having a conversation and I said to her, where do you buy your gold? And she said, oh, from the bank. And the minute she said it, she said, uh oh, I know what you mean, I don't know. Okay. Um, and so we started talking. She was very interested because it's a family-owned business. They produce everything in their workshops in Geneva. You know, everything is made by a community um, of people in Geneva. And she was very excited at the idea of, of going at the, at the bottom of their supply chain, at the beginning of their supply chain, and start to change that. So they could have done, they could have just bought differently and bought different gold, but instead they decided to act as source and, and to do things properly, which puts them at, at, at the leadership of the jewelry industry and sector because no one has ever done that. So they made a strategic alliance with partnership with the Alliance for Responsible Mining, ARM, which um, it, ARM is axing South America, and they, they take these communities of abandoned communities of, of people who dig gold with little less, little nothing, with age, stone age tools. And, and basically it's giving them a legs up and it's, try, it's, it's taking these community miners to fair trade mining and fair mine, mining um, and giving them a place in the market. So sh it's very courageous what Chopard is doing and very admirable. Uh, we're building with them a, a very comprehensive journey uh, sustainability into a sustainability which will take years to we have various steps and every can will announce something exciting so next can we have a big another big announcement with them great um but it's very it's very exciting and we hope that all other jewelers follow suit yes and this is what we need today we need leaders and we need you know brands that show leadership in that sector mm. Chopard is definitely a leader 
And I suppose with something that you're doing is that you're not only making those changes and implementing those changes, but you're also then getting those products out there. I mean, yeah. not everybody has access to the red carpet, but what you've done is, is really bring something to the masses. Yeah, and also to prove that, you know, to be a profitable business, a profitable brand, and be a good stewardship of environmental and social justice is, is not only possible, it's, it's what we need to do, it's what mm -hmm. brands have to do. So mm -hmm. being, taking care of the people who make your products and making sure that the environment is taken care of, it, it doesn't equal loss, yeah. you know? Yeah. So for you, it's a little bit like a food label now. Would you ideally like every item of clothing or a handbag or an accessory to come with a full label of made by so-and-so in this country? I mean, yeah. how, how far can be it go? Wonderful. Because that would be really lovely. Well, if I buy a, a handbag, not that I do for 3,000 pounds, <laughs> but if I buy a Gucci handbag and they go for two to 3,000 pounds, and I understand the workmanship and the craftsmanship that goes into that, but if I had the story, like the, the bag that you've done, if I had the story about the people who'd made it, I would be so much more inclined to spend that money yeah. than I do now when it's just got a Gucci label. And I think what you're, for me, having met you, which has been such an honor, is to really now question where those things are coming from. Because I think I trusted the brands before and I presumed that they were doing it all. And now I realize I have a responsibility as a consumer to ask those to questions. Ask yeah. And if those people aren't answering them, then I will shop elsewhere. Good. So you've <laughs> yes. changed one person and hopefully more. <laughs> so I'm going to open up to some Q&A and then we're going to actually watch a film that you're going to talk about at the end, which is, represents everything we've just spoken about and very excited about. So I'm going to open up to the audience. If we have any questions, I will... We have someone with a microphone um, who is going to pass you the microphone. And please feel free. We have a lady at the back. Thank you. Hi, Olivia. Hi. Um, I just wondered, uh, have you ever gone into dealing with a lot of the more high street brands as opposed to the high designer and what are your thoughts on that? I spoke to a lot of them, um, particularly after Rana Plaza, what happened, which, you know, a lot of them had to react and do something about it. It's, you know, it's very complicated. Hopefully, we are working on a project as we speak that hopefully will bring a big change to that. But the high street brands, which presumably you're talking about the fast fashion brands, um, is a very, very complicated because it's their business model that doesn't work. So as I say, to have a, 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 fa a brand that goes into Bangladesh in this case, plays an order for 1.5 million shorts to be produced for 60p each, you know, it's so I don't have the answer to to solve that because, but I know that there must be an alternative business model for those brands, um, and hopefully they're gonna we're gonna change that. But you know, today it, it was in the news the, uh, the the fact that the Bangladeshi government has proposed to double the minimum wage to take it from thirty dollars a month to six, sixty dollars a month which already is, it will still be the lowest in the world. And the workers as a, have actually protested and they want $100 minimum wage a month, which it will still be the lowest in the world. And the factory owners are protesting against the government because they say that if they put the $60 minimum wage, all the brands will leave Bangladesh and go produce elsewhere. So it's really alarming. So my question on that, thank you, is is if they start raising the wage in Bangladesh, and you probably don't have the answer, but are they then not going to go to other countries, other developing countries, and start using their people? Well, they shouldn't. To, they shouldn't. <laughs> they shouldn't. So, but in order for us to help um, that, then we have to stop shopping at those places. Or demand changes at the brand. You know, brand listen to consumers. They listen to their clients. So if all of us started asking questions, the brand will listen to them and start changing. Yeah. So we should really, we should consume less in the first place anyway. Yeah. And when then if we you can commit to wearing that garment 30 times, as Lucy Siegel said, you know, probably you would automatically find yourself shopping much less. Yeah. Well, if I'm in a Roland Murray jumpsuit, then it's not a problem to wear it 30 <laughs> times. And if I shop in the, in the cheaper stores, then 
invariably they they're ruined up before 30 times so i know the answer to that is yeah. to spend a little bit more for a better quality um and to walk past all those big stores on oxford street and yeah. not go in there <laughs> do we have any other questions from the audience yes gentlemen here hi um have you found that since big names such as gucci have got involved and the other designers have decided to approach you rather than you having to call them and see if they want to get like, greener solutions? Yeah, definitely. The more designers get on board, the more want to join. Uh, there is always that first movers advantage. You know, who does it first? Um, and the fact that Gucci, we launched the handbag with Gucci, got a lot of attention and other brands got that message and they started to get an interest in what we were doing and asked to do more, definitely. Definitely. Good. Long may it continue. More questions. Lady at the front. Hi, Livia. Um, do you apply it also to children's fashion or it's mainly women? At the moment, we, the brand that we work with is more, is more for a more mature um, market. But children, I would love to do it because, you know, my children are now almost at teenager level and it's that very delicate phase where they stop wearing what I buy and they want to wear what the other mates uh, wear and they all shop at the high street and fast fashion. So I'm the bad mother. Right now I'm really the bad mother. <laughs> so I would have to do it. I would love to do a project on children's fashion. Yeah. We'll watch this space. We have another question. Thank you. Yes. Hi, Olivia. I think what you're doing is wonderful. Um, and I'm actually involved in the launch of a uh, a women's wear brand, which is actually green carpet, essentially, by, by your, your terminology today. I'm just wondering mm -hmm. if there's some help you can give in terms of guiding us on, on how, to, how to approach this in, of course. in the way that you're doing. Write to a, me and I'll brand. help you, of course. <laughs> EcoAge yeah. Consultancy yes. is there for everyone. What he has a question. Oh, we have another question. No, we were looking at doing the same thing, and the question is, where do you find proper advice and... Um, my question is, I, what I was going to add about yeah. not just the labor, but the source of materials. Yeah. What are the other critical issues that we should be looking at factoring into our considerations? And, uh, for example, the, uh, what are the, the cost of production? If you're looking at labor costs in third world countries, what are those equivalents, for example, in the Western world? Why couldn't one uh, look at assessing production in the UK or Italy or anywhere else in well, the EU? Slavery happens around the corner from us too. You know, sweatshops are in England too, um, in Italy, everywhere. Um, so it's about. It's not about the. Obviously, the distance is creates that separ help creating that separation and that not caring. But as a producer, as a brand owner, you have the responsibility to make sure that your production, no matter where it happens, is done, taking into consideration the person who produce. I was just going to ask, what's pr what has propelled you to focus in on these issues recently? Can we just use the microphone again? I'd love to ask the gentleman, is this something that's always been on your agenda or have you actually been much more aware of it in the last few years and why? I was for a charitable trust because we recognized that it was not economic right. and that there was social justice uh, impetus. And uh, we're trying to assess what that alternate business model would be. Thank you. Okay, thank, thank you. you. Yeah, I can, I can add to that. Um, actually, actually, we're going through a relaunch of our brand. And the, and the first time around, I spent quite a bit of, I went, made many trips to India. And I saw firsthand, actually, how you know, many, you know, young children are being used, actually, for these things. And we had to do quite a lot of work to sort of make sure that you know, things were done in a good way for us. So as we're going through this relaunch, it became very you know, important as an aspect to think about. Um, and then recently at the fabric shows, I started to come across people who were really, you know, sort of uh, promoting this, even the, even like the Wool Growers Association of Australia or the, the Cotton Growers Association mm -hmm. of, in the US. And it, and it just became something that I thought that's, that's not just something that, that, that we can rely on other people to do. As a new brand, that's something that we can really just sort of in, take forward from the beginning. And it's Great. important to me personally, actually. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. That's fantastic. Right. Do we have any more questions? I am just going to hand over to Livia now. We've got a really special premiere tonight, which we're going to watch now, of a film that Livia has been working on with Bill Nighy's daughter, the actor's daughter, Mary Nighy. And it is absolutely beautiful, and it really represents everything that we've spoken about. So I'm going to let Livia talk a little bit about it, and then we're going to watch that. 
Well, Mary is a beautiful filmmaker, and I got introduced to her by Anna Winter. And I, when I, I always quote Ali Hewson, who says that we wear the stories of the people who make our clothes. Can you uh, just quickly tell us a little bit about Ali Hewson, in case everyone doesn't know? Because she's obviously a real peer with you, isn't she? She's a real wingman, wingwoman. Yes. Ali um, is... Well, I only met once, by the way. Mm -hmm. I don't know her really well. But I love what she does. Um, she founded a company called Eden many, many years ago. Um, trying to take sustainability into a fashion brand. Um, and she's worked relentlessly ever since. And she's the wife of Bono. She's the wife the of Bono. Campaign together about yes. a lot of things. Yes. Okay. And so I always quote Ali because th she said it better than anyone. It's true. You know, when you choose a dress, you, you, you carry with you the stories of the person who, who made that dress. So when I said that to Mary, Mary had this idea of the handprints. Um, appearing on a dress and I don't I won't reveal much but we did this project um, we screened it at the um, co launch of the Green Carpet Challenge capsule collection at London Fashion Week this year with Roland Moray and Victoria Beckham and Christopher Bailey Adam and Christopher Kane uh, and, and Natalie um, Massane and Anna Winter I'll just add in there it was, yeah. it was a really fun night it was, <laughs> it was you, a really fun night you have the right people coming to support yes. you for sure <laughs> Um, and so we made this movie um, as a, you know, as a reminder. It's a very beautiful movie. And Electra Whiteman, who is a wonderful um, model and, and friend and environmentalist, uh, she accepted to be in the film, which was beautiful. Yeah, it's great. Um, she happens to be Isabella Rossellini's daughter, so it's beautiful too. Great. And, um, and all the brands, Chopard is in there, all the brands who, who did the Green Carpet Challenge are in there. So it's beautiful. Great, well, we'll take a Enjoy look. Enjoy it. Yes. Congratulations. Thank That's you. It's beautiful. Congratulations to you and to Mary Nye, the director. Ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to thank Livia Fath. You're an inspiration. I respect everything you do. Long may it continue. And I'm going to think twice again about what I buy and what I wear. Thank you Good. very, very much. Ladies <laughs> and gentlemen, you. Livia Fath. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Thank you.